Is it possible to understand the book of Revelation? Or is it a Chinese puzzle that no one can decipher? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleagues Tim Moore and Nathan Jones are in the studio with me today to answer questions about the book of Revelation, and I want to jump right into the questions so that we can cover as many as possible. So, fellas, let's hit the ground rolling. Most of these questions have been sent in by our viewers. In some places I have their names, some places I don't, but they've come from viewers. And the first one is this, what would you say is the fundamental key to understanding the book of Revelation? Wow, that's a, that's a simple question, but uh, really is more than one key. I will actually use three, and I'll go to four. I think the first key is to use the plain sense as you're reading Revelation, not looking for any kind of nonsense or speculative, but the plain sense. I also think we need to understand that John lays out a template for Revelation in verse one, or excuse me, verse 19 of chapter one, where he says, "Therefore write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things." So understanding the template. The third thing I will say, and I know I'm cheating Dave by using three keys, is to have a good scriptural foundation of Old Testament and New <laughs> Testament understanding so that what John speaks of has meaning if you understand scripture. And really I'm going to cheat and actually have a fourth which you have to believe. In other words, Revelation is not hard to understand if you believe. It is hard to believe if you don't have belief. Okay, thank you. Well, let's go to the second question. Did John write the book of Revelation nearer to 60 A.D. or was it like 95 A.D.? And what difference does it matter? Well, it clearly was 95 A.D. because the early church fathers such as Eusebius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, they wrote about John being a whopping 97 years old in 95 AD. He died two years later being released from Patmos. He was back in Ephesus and he was 99. So it is without a doubt that the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD. Now, there's a group called the Preterists who believe that all Bible prophecy found, especially in Revelation, occurred in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Now, that can't be if John wrote the book 25 years later. So they so, argue it was written before 70 AD. Yeah, right. but that argument didn't arise until about the year 1600. So when that argument came about, they had to move back the writing of the book of Revelation to make their argument substantive. And obviously we know better. Absolutely. In fact, the, the type of persecution that's mentioned in there did not occur until Diocletian. Mm -hmm. So it, it's obvious 95 AD. Okay, well number attested. three. This comes from Ray S. in Utah. If Christians are raptured before the tribulation begins, then why bother to study the book of Revelation? Well, I think why bother studying the Old Testament? We didn't live in those days, but the Old Testament provides a foundation. It provides the prophetic fulfillment that Jesus manifest when He came to earth the first time with His first coming and His ministry. And it gives us an understanding of the sweep of human history from creation all the way to the culmination at the end of the age. And so God has provided this for us to better understand Him and His revelation of Himself. And I'd also add that you get a bona fide blessing for verse what, chapter 1, verse yes, 3. Do. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the Amen. words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. You are promised a blessing if you study, read, and take to heart the book of Revelation. Plus, Amen. the book of Revelation gives great hope. It assures us that we're going to win in the end. Amen. And Jesus is glorified here on the earth in Absolutely. the end. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. The fourth question. This is from Jim G. What is the day of the Lord that John refers to in Revelation 1.10? Is he talking about Sunday? No. Nah. <laughs> well, there's two references. What John's saying is that he was on the island of Patmos on the Lord's Day. And so the Lord's Day is a reference to the early church being Sunday. So yes, so John's saying on Sunday, Jesus Christ came to me and then brought me up to heaven to see the day of the Lord. So you've got a kind of a word play there. You've got the Lord's Day is Sunday, but then he was taken to see the day of the Lord, which is another name for the seven year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble or the day of God's wrath. It's, it, that's what he's referring to with the day of the Lord. I agree. Okay. Fifth question, Revelation 1-1 says the things described in the book, quote, must shortly take place. Does this mean that the prophecies contained in the book were fulfilled in the first century? That's a very good question. 
Well, I agree that that's a very good question, and I think it's important sometimes for us, even when we have a favorite translation, to use other valid translations in our English language of Scripture. So, for instance, in the King James Version, it says, must shortly come to pass. And that creates a little bit different emphasis. It's not just that they're going to happen in a soon period of time, but they're going to happen quickly. If you go back to the original text, those words that we translate shortly or shortly come to pass, in Greek says must soon come to pass, but it also means soon, quickly, shortly, and speedily. I think what John is saying is he wanted to emphasize the imminence of this period of, of the earth coming about, in other words, the imminence of Jesus' return for His church, and then when it begins, it will happen very quickly. Now, you say, well, that's been 2,000 years. That's not exactly speedily. But had John said, well, eventually these things will come to a pass, it would have had a completely different emphasis. So, I think the word that he used in Greek indicates that it will imminently happen, and then when it does, it will happen very quickly. Well, not only that, not only what the word he uses, but just history itself proves that what he was talking about was imminent. So, these are things exactly. that could happen any moment, and they haven't happened, so we know he's speaking about imminence. Preterists take the position that because of this, all of these prophecies had to be fulfilled before 70 AD. Where? How were they fulfilled? No. And the only way they can argue it is to spiritualize exactly. all of them to mean something other than what they say. Exactly yeah. right. The Greek word is zyntaki. It means when it happens, it'll happen fast. And that's what John was referring exactly to. Okay, right. let's go to the next one. This is from Johnny R. of Arkansas. We've got the state here. Oh. And he says, Do the seven churches of Revelation represent time periods in church history? Ooh, all right. Absolutely. Well, let's bear in mind, though, that Jesus wanted John to record a letter that would go to seven actual churches in Asia Minor. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Every one of which was a different kind of church. It was yes. Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey, and it went in yes. a circle all the way around and then back to Ephesus again. Now, each of these churches, though, now that we have hindsight, we can look back and see there were different time periods. For instance, the legalistic church, Ephesus, you occurred between 30 and 95. We see the persecuted church, Smyrna, between 95 and 312. We can see that the different personality traits that God gave it, we credit them for doing something good and admonish now, them for doing something bad. all of them existed bad. during all that period of time, right. but sure. the predominant one was... Represents a time period, which would put us in the last one, Laodicea, the apathetic boy, church. boy, are we ever there. 1925 there. to today. You can find in every church, really, kind of one of these churches represented, and you can find in every believer this one of these churches represented, and one of the too. Church, and every church that we have today. Right. So, I think this was the <laughs> template that you brought up earlier about the outline given in the Bible, what John saw, what's going on, and then what's the future, chapter 2 and 3, deal with church history all 2,000 years. I agree. And I think it's, it's important to realize, as you said, we are in these last days. So, Laodicea thought itself rich, but the Lord said, you're blind and wretched and poor and naked. And surely that describes oh, yes, our culture even today. One of the worst churches pictured in the Bible, and yet I, on the internet one day, I typed in Laodicea Church, and there was there are some churches that are named Laodicea. I don't think they've oh, ever no. read the Book no, of Revelation. Maybe not. <laughs> know thyself. Okay. Uh, many promises are made to overcomers in chapters two and three of Revelation. In fact, a whole bunch of them, about fourteen promises are made. Who are overcomers? Well, I love the promises themselves because all of us can claim those promises for ourselves. Whether it is to sit on the throne of Jesus, whether it is to reign with Him, to eat of the tree of life, to eat of hidden manna, or this is what I love, Nathan, to get a new name. Absolutely. Uh, my parents gave me this name, but the Lord's going to give me a new name. John tells us in 1 John, I'll actually go back there, chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, he says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus Hallelujah. is the Son Amen. of God. So, Amen. if you put your faith so in Jesus, an I am an overcomer, <laughs> as are you and you and anyone else watching today who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, great. Number eight, where is the rapture in the book of Revelation? Well, that's uh, <laughs> people look for the rapture in the book of Revelation. I find it particularly in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 10, where the church is promised to not have to endure those days. It ties with 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and 5.9 and other verses where the church, the bride of Christ, is promised not to have to endure it. So, there's a reference to the rapture there, but if you're looking for a symbolic no. example of the rapture, when John was caught up, and that's what rapture means, caught up and taken to heaven to see the tribulation and the millennial kingdom, the eternal state that would follow, that is a form of the rapture of the church. 
Amen. Okay. And that happens in chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, come up here. And immediately he's taken up and sees all the things that transpired during the tribulation. Okay, here's a wonderful question from Leah N. It says, do chapter 6 through 19 represent the wrath of God being poured out on the earth, or is the wrath of God limited only to certain judgments during the seven years of the tribulation? No, all of that is the wrath of God in this sense. We're told that uh, in chapter 6, verse 1, it is Jesus Himself That's who breaks seal the seals. Yeah. He breaks every seal. In chapter 6, verse 16, the people on the earth recognize that this is the wrath of the Lamb. So they understand that. Uh, we're told that the angels are commanded by God to blow trumpets. And so the, the trumpet judgments, that is the wrath of God. All of this is God pouring out His wrath to restore people or bring them to repentance and obviously yeah. to punish those who are And that's a very important point because when people argue that uh, only certain things are the wrath of God, like the bold judgments at the end, then they can argue that uh, the rapture is going to occur in the middle of the tribulation right. because we're only protected from the wrath of God. And the first part is the wrath of Satan or the wrath of man or something like that. But there are some very queer clear wording that tells us that. Like Revelation 6.17 calls it the great day of His wrath, Greek Hamera. In other words, yes. the wrath began with the seal judgments. You get to the bold judgment says this is the end of His yeah, wrath, right. where it's that's ending. Right. So, clearly everything that came before was wrath as okay, well. Okay, very quickly from Gene S. Throughout chapters 6 through 19 there are references to saints. Is this speaking of the church? And if so, doesn't this refute the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture? Good question. Hmm. Well, there's always been saints. You've got Old Testament saints. <laughs> you've got church age saints. These are the tribulation saints. These are the people that after the church has been raptured will get saved after that. Okay. Are the series of judgments in Revelation 6 through 19 presented in chronological order? We only have a few seconds, fellas. I think there's no reason to believe otherwise. In other words, if you step through even the seal judgments, for instance, we have the false Christ manifesting himself, which leads to war, which leads to famine, death, and then martyrdom. That is a very chronological flow, and I think there's no reason not to think that the entire book of Revelation and the judgments are chronological in order. Folks, I've never heard these two guys talk so fast in all my life. We've got a lot of questions covered. We're going to cover more. We're we're going to take a brief break for a special announcement, and then we'll be right back with more questions and more answers concerning the book of Revelation. So hang on. Hello, my name is Nathan Jones, Internet Evangelist here at Lamb and Lion Ministries. We're using the Internet to proclaim the soon return of Jesus Christ to the billions of people who are connected online now and after the rapture. I would like to invite you to come and check out our website at ChristinProphecy.org. Watch whole episodes of Christ in Prophecy and our short Prophetic Perspectives and the Inbox series for in-depth teaching about end-time events. Read from the library of articles on our website and blog covering all aspects of God's prophetic Word. Subscribe to our free e-newsletter to receive the Lamplighter magazine, as well as to our social media to stay up to date on current events as they relate to Bible prophecy. Equip yourself to share the good news with others using materials from our online store. I invite you to come and visit ChristinProphecy.org today. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our responses to questions about the book of Revelation. And let me emphasize something. We could talk an hour about every one of these questions, but what we're trying to do is cover as many as possible and just give you the, the fundamental facts or truth about each question. So, fellas, let's get back to it. Uh, the first question that I want to ask is one about whether or not the book of Revelation is in chronological order. Well, to follow what Tim said, absolutely. The Bible from beginning to end is chronological order. The seals, the trumpets, and the bowls aren't iterations of the seal judgments. They're separate judgments. But there's times where you get to where it looks so terrible and everyone's panicking and you don't know if you want to keep reading Revelation that Jesus stops it. He gives you a flash forward in Revelation uh, 10 and uh, other chapters where He stops. So, they're parentheses. They flash forward to the end to see Jesus' victory to give the reader hope that everything's going to turn out okay. Yeah, I think that's the problem people have is we're used to flashbacks in movies, flashbacks in novels, but not flash forwards. No, no. But God knows the future, and so He gives us flash forwards, and you have to watch for those in the book. I think it's beautiful even in the first chapter of Revelation in verse 4 and in verse 8, John captures the fact that 
he is talking to and recording. He's being dictated these letters, for instance, from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And so Jesus right there captures in his own title the fact that he is, he was, and he is to come. Past, present, and future. There you go. And so Revelation has Good the point. whole overplay of human history, and God can see it all from a God's eye view, if you will. Next question. The seventh chapter of Revelation mentions 144,000 persons who are going to be sealed by the Holy Spirit and serve as special servants of God during the tribulation. Most commentaries say this is a symbolic reference to the church. Others say it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. What about it? <laughs> I cannot imagine, in all honesty, how someone could read chapter 7 and see reiterated over and over again that these are 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And just in case you didn't understand that point, then the Lord goes on to say, from the tribe of Judah, from the tribe of Asher, Yet from the, the tribe most of Manasseh. Most commentaries say they're the church. Yeah, well, you know what? That is a commentary that has spiritualized the clear text of Scripture. And it's also a reflection of replacement theology. Oh, it most certainly is. We, we don't have any purpose. And quite frankly, it's a reflection of a degree of anti Semitism yes. that has resented the Jews and resented God's blessing on them and denies uh, Romans 11, 9 through 11, denies many other promises that are still to be fulfilled not because of Jewish faithfulness, but because of God's faithfulness. And really a person who would comment that this is just to be appropriated by the church is dismissing the very promises of God and emptying God's faithfulness. Okay. Let's go to the next one. The, you wrote an article about this recently, so I'm going to address okay. this to you, Nathan. Okay. The war of the Antichrist that begins in chapter 6 with his attempt to conquer the world seems to morph into a nuclear war beginning with the trumpet judgments in chapter 8 where it speaks of one third of the earth being burned. Could this be the case? Absolutely. Uh, clearly the nuclear arsenal, we have enough nuclear weapons to incinerate the world over 40 times. Yeah. And it's being held back by, by the hand of God, the restraining influence you read in the Bible. But as you read through the Bible, uh, take for instance here in Revelation 6, 14, then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the rich men, and they all hide themselves in caves and cry out for the wrath of the Lamb to stop. That is an exact description of what a nuclear explosion looks like as the sky rolls away. So as the Antichrist conquers the world and sets up his kingdom and a quarter of the world population dies, we know that the nuclear arsenal at some point will be re let loose on the earth. Yes, and in Luke 21 verse 26 Jesus said that in that time men will faint from fear over the expectation of things coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That sounds like nuclear war to me. It Absolutely. does. Okay, next question. The fifth trumpet judgment is presented as a plague of locusts that is allowed to torment mankind for five months with horrible stings. What are these locusts? Are they some type of special locusts? Or are they a first century picture of a modern day drones? Or could they be demons? This is from Martha C. Good question. That is a good question. I will actually use an analogy of what we're experiencing right now. The reason our hair is a little long as Nathan and I were commenting. Our world has seen a novel coronavirus, something we'd never seen before, come upon us as a pandemic. And so even here in the modern era we have new, uh, and I won't even call them improved, but new and deadly forms of viruses. This will be something new and I won't even call it deadly because the Lord says that these locusts will not be able to kill anyone. They will just sting and torment. And it also says that they are restrained in terms of their power. So they can only inflict those who do not already have the seal of God upon them. And so those who have rejected Jesus Christ will be tormented. They will wish they could die, but they will, will, will not be able to. So whether th this is a, a natural pestilence or whether this is a spiritualized demon, I don't think Scripture is exactly yeah. clear on. Okay. And so I'm not going to speculate, but it will be a novel form of tormenting that the world has never seen. The sixth trumpet introduces an army of 200 million that kills one-third of mankind. Is this a real army or is it a supernatural army of demons? Uh, good question. Well, I would piggyback on what you said about the demons. At least in my interpretation, I land at the, the, what is released out of the bottomless pit is that we have demons that are disembodied and torment mankind, but there are special demons kept in this place called the bottomless pit in Hades yes. that separates I paradise. That and, as well. Yeah, I, I thought you did. Yes. And these they are let loose. So we are talking about a 200 million man army. We're talking about four generals who ride these chimera-like creatures and these locust demons 
all released out of the bottomless pit to torment people during the trumpet judgments. And so to me, it's an interpretation that this isn't a 200 million man human army. Now, this army from the east, which we read about later at the yes. end of the tribulation, that's human. But this appears to be demonic in nature. Okay. Next question. In Revelation 10, there is a reference to seven peals of thunder. What are these? <laughs> you know, this is a one of the mysteries that we don't know for sure in this regard. John was about to record what the thunders actually said, and he was told, no, don't write that down. And so we don't even know what it was that they said. I think it's important to recognize, though, that these seven peals of thunder come in response to the lion roar of the strong angel, Nathan, one of your famous strong angels, that comes down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, with rainbow upon his head, his face like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. And when he roars like a lion, then these seven thunders peal in response. We don't know for sure. It could be very much the earth itself crying out a response of rejoicing and celebrating that finally it is about to be restored as was promised. Uh, there will be no more delay, we're told, in verse 6 once this occurs. So as soon as the, the thunders peal, whatever the words were in response to this roar, we are told that there will no longer be a delay for the restoration of the earth. Because it says, the, uh, the angel says, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. In other words, it is finally time for the earth to be restored. So what it's what the thunder said, we do not know, but it is a rejoicing celebration that the time has now come. Okay, anything to add to that or we go to the next question? Well, uh, I was uh, really disappointed when I read that because, you know, you get this climatic scene and these thunders say something and then the angel says, John, don't write that. Don't let people know. And you're like, oh man. So yes, it is very disappointing. Okay. Revelation 11 says there will be two witnesses in Jerusalem who will be preaching during the first half of the tribulation, calling the world to repentance. Who will these two men be? Boy, I get that question all the time. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's a few theories. Uh, mostly people land on Elijah because Elijah was promised to precede Jesus' return, although John the Baptist did that. So could it be Elijah? Some say Moses because Moses didn't die, but he did die, we read in Jude. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's Moses. Others look to Enoch who was raptured before the flood. So you've got Elijah and Enoch who didn't die. They would be logical candidates. There's also a third, not as popular, but they're just two men, two Jewish men who got saved after the rapture and they fulfilled the role of prophet. Yeah, uh, the early church fathers were almost unanimous in saying that they thought it was going to be uh, Elijah and Enoch. Uh, in modern day times, more people are talking about Elijah and uh, Moses because of the type of miracles that were performed and because those were the two who appeared at the transfiguration with uh, Jesus. Uh, but we don't know for sure. No. We just don't know for sure. You want to add anything to no, that? No, sir, I agree okay. that we don't know for sure. Chapter 13 of Revelation contains a lot of symbolic imagery. What do the woman and the child represent? Well, I think that is a good example back in chapter 12 where the woman and the child are presented that Scripture defines itself. And so it talks about this woman and the child. And yet as you read the description of the woman, she is a woman who has the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown, a crown of 12 stars. And she gives birth to a male child. And of course the dragon stood, stands above trying to uh, devour the child. But the child she gives birth to is a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, and yes. her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Well, clearly that child is none other than Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And yet, recently we had prophecy experts saying it was the church oh, that yes. this was evidence of a rapture that was about to occur. Well, they were looking at astronomical signs. They called it the great sign of Revelation 12. Kind of Jupiter speculation that drives me nuts. It, it drives me the crazy Bible as well. The Bible interpreted it right there. Right said, there it did. So clearly the woman is Israel. The woman and the is Israel. Is and the Lord Jesus. speaks to Israel as a woman and calls her at times and, and in, in fact, the past that's not the as first a time that imagery is used of Israel. It's used by Joseph in one of his dreams. Exactly Absolutely. right. So Israel being called a woman, the Lord Himself referred to her as a harlot. And when He said, you have been unfaithful to Me, He had prophets that spoke to that evidence in the past. And so I think the woman is Israel. I don't just think. Scripture says. And <laughs> yeah. the child is Jesus Christ. Okay, well, we're so. about out of time. One last question. Revelation 13, 14 says that in the middle of the tribulation, a remnant of the Jews will be saved from the Antichrist, quote, on the two wings of a great eagle. Is this eagle a symbol of the United States? And if so, does that 
mean that our nation is going to provide the end time airlift that will save the Jews sent by Catherine C. of Washington State? And a question I get all the time. Well, in context, Israel is, is, is fleeing out of Jerusalem because the Antichrist desecrates the temple, and they're taken under two wings of a great eagle and protected in the wilderness. People said, oh, well, America's symbol is an eagle. Therefore, America flies in, and we rescue the Jews, and we bring them out. But again, symbolic and Bible prophecy it interprets itself. You just have to go back to Exodus 19.4, Deuteronomy 32.11, Ruth 2.12. It's talking about the Holy Spirit's protective Amen. wings over its chicks. And there are eight nations in the world today whose national symbol is an that. eagle. Mexico, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, <laughs> Egypt. Zimbabwe is going to yeah, sweep Zimbabwe in. could sweep Zimbabwe in. Could <laughs> and we know from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, that all of the nations of the earth will come against Jerusalem, against the Lord as He returns. Turns. And so that will include the United States if we're still here. We are not that eagle nation. Well, folks, uh, those are the questions that we had for this program. Uh, I hope you'll be back with us next week because then we're going to look at some more questions concerning the book of Revelation, concerning the second half. These have all been concerning this first half. And then we're going to have a third program that's going to focus on the last aspect of Revelation that talks about the eternal state. So stay with us over these weeks. God bless you. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope the Lord willing that you will be back with us next week when we will continue to respond to questions about the book of Revelation. This week, we have managed to get to only the middle of the tribulation, so we have a lot of territory yet to cover. Next week, Lord willing, we'll take a look at questions concerning the second half of the tribulation, and the week after that, we'll take a look at what the book of Revelation has to say about the millennium and the eternal state. Until next week, this is Tim Moore speaking for Lamb & Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you would like to learn more about the book of Revelation, please consider Dr. Reagan's comprehensive survey entitled Wrath and Glory. In this easy to read book, Dr. Reagan takes you through the book of Revelation one chapter at a time and clearly explains the meaning of each chapter, relying on a literal plain sense interpretation. The book also contains Dr. Reagan's responses to the most commonly asked questions about Revelation and concludes with lessons drawn from the book of Revelation that we can apply to our lives as we try to live for Christ in the end times. You can secure a copy of this book for a gift of $20 or more more, and that includes the cost of shipping. Revelation Revealed is a 75-minute DVD presentation of a fascinating and informative survey of the book of Revelation. Dr. Reagan's masterful teaching and the art of Pat Marvenko Smith brings this video to life. Revelation Revealed is available for a gift of $20 or more, including shipping. When you place your order today, you may obtain both of these helpful resources for a gift of $30 or more, including shipping. Ask for offer number 703. Just call the number you see on the screen between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday, or place your order on our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 